So this is the crux of the story that uh, Peter's work has focused on for a while. And the idea is very simple, that during the warm uh, summer hemisphere, you have southwesterly monsoon winds. And if you remember the way Ekman transport works in the northern hemisphere to the right of the winds, then you expect uh, Ekman transport out of the northern Indian Ocean across the equator and you can see that to the south of here in the south southeasterly trades it always remains southward so there is a net uh, upper ocean southward transport but in the uh, uh, northern Indian Ocean you can see that during the boreal winter monsoon you would expect from the summer hemisphere win into the winter hemisphere uh, Ekman transport and in the boreal summer uh, similarly from the summer hemisphere into the winter hemisphere. Does this end up regulating the annual cycle of the monsoon? This is the key question. And then the rest of the arguments are based on saying that there does seem to be some sort of a um, uh, regulation happening. So I'm not going to read the uh, caption here, but you can read it. It's based on various calculations from a forced ocean model, coupled atmosphere ocean model, and basically the time scale can be found, but there is no strong, strong evidence of the relation between the monsoon itself and those uh, cross-equatorial fluxes. Okay, The uh, Ekman transport we defined before going from some uh, depth uh, in the ocean to the surface uh, of the integral of the uh, Ekman currents. So currents are individual parcels and transport is the volume moving, right? So you have the zonal and latitudinal transports defined this way and when we put in the relations uh, from the momentum equations, uh, which we will see in a minute again, uh, we remember that the uh, Ekman transport is proportional to 1 over F. So the question is when you propose such a cross equatorial transport, where does the Ekman transport actually happen? In general, uh, boundary, uh, uh, western boundaries are, are, or eastern boundaries are typical candidates because there you can cross the equator by generating PV or verticity or losing verticity by friction whereas in the open we in the open ocean we generally assume that because Coriolis changes sign uh, verticity changes sign it's not so easy so the idea here is to see if cross equatorial ocean uh, Ekman heat transport can occur. It turns out that the Indian Ocean has a very typical uh, um, distribution of uh, heat, so that does happen. And we will look at a one and a half layer model like we did before, uh, where the active layer is above the thermocline and then below is a deep motionless layer with no pressure gradients. The equations are written in terms of that thickness of the active layer. So there's the Coriolis, there is the pressure gradient. So H is the depth of the uh, active layer, but it's also the C surface height and the thermocline depth variability. So that can be related to the pressure gradient. So pressure gradient uh, dH dx uh, becomes dP dx becomes d squared at d h squared dx. So um, g tilde here is our uh, favorite reduced gravity and that becomes equals to tau x and uh, f h u uh, plus uh, one half g tilde d h squared dy equal to zero. So that's got the uh, the dimension of a pressure gradient and this is the continuity equation in the layer uh, with currents u and v being advected uh, in the, as a transport within that layer. The key part there is that the the wind distribution in the Indian Ocean has this kind of a structure with uh, westerlies to the north and easterlies to the south. So if you have this kind of a zonal meridional distribution with the seasonal variability, you can uh, plug that into these equations, this equation here, do the cross derivation of uh, 
this with respect to y, this with respect to x, and do the things we did before to derive the and plug it into the continuity equation uh, which is given by this. Okay, so we are just going to take uh, this and create dh dx, this and create dh dy, and then plug it in to get this equation dh dt minus beta or f square g tilde h h x equals minus d dy tau x or f, where we have our uh, form of the Ekman transport. So if you look at this relation, tau x or f, f is beta y on the beta plane. So this you divide by beta y, this d y disappears. So then d dy of tau x or f will be uh, zero. So these two terms then become independent of uh, each other. Okay, that's the key question. So for beta, which is the uh, meridional gradient of f, uh, then we end up with d dy uh, of tau x or f equal to zero. Make sure you understand, it's very clear. You just divide by f on both sides and write f as uh, beta y, and this y disappears. Beta is a constant and these are independent of y. So you end up with that, which also means that on the equator uh, Ekman pumping is going to be uh, zero. Okay, so you have no problem creating the uh, Ekman transport across the equator. So in this nice paper by Toru Miyama, you have the uh, details of this calculation. So they assume that the initial state is at rest, so h is uh, fixed, is, is a constant depth h, and in that case the uh, equation here gives dh dt equal to zero, so we end up with a constant h, initial zonal velocity is zero, and you get meridional uh, Ekman transport given by minus tau x or fh, where we replace uh, beta with uh, the derivative of uh, tau x, so minus one over beta h tau x y, so tau x y, okay? Probably should be written the other way. Nonetheless, this is essentially our uh, spread of transport, right? Tau x or beta is basically uh, meridional derivative of the zonal wind divided by beta. Remember the spread of transport is related to curl tau, so it's uh, the wind stress curl, uh, which is also related to the Ekman transport. But here, Ekman transport just becomes equal to spread of transport with the special distribution of meridional winds in this idealized case. And we can argue that there is Ekman transport across the equator. This is true. And you can see this very nice example of how that may be working. So this is data from uh, way back in uh, 1968 from uh, Bruce Swallow and I think Bruce Swallow and Bruce, uh, maybe Warren Bruce and Bruce Swallow, I forgot. But nonetheless, it's really amazing. You s look at these sites, look at these few sites here. Winds are blowing this way in each case, okay? This is what you would expect. The uh, transports at 10 meter, 40 meter, 60 meter, you have a bit of the uh, Ekman spiral, and transports are to the right of the winds, which is what you expect in the northern hemisphere. Amazingly, in these boundary uh, regions here, the transports uh, are following the uh, Ekman spiral, but they are to the left of the winds, which basically means that the Ekman uh, transport has been advected across the equator into the northern hemisphere close to the equator, which is related to those nice swirls that we saw in terms of the southern gyre and the great whirl and so on. So there is definitely cross-equatorial Ekman transport, which is uh, uh, confirmed by these observations and their nice distribution in the vertical, which corresponds to the uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, Coriolis effect, okay? So, long story short, uh, it looks like 
uh, monsoon winds drive uh, uh, southward Ekman transport and then the question is now uh, and there is a, a, a open ocean Ekman transport across the equator in the Indian Ocean. The question then is what happens when the monsoon is stronger than normal and weaker than normal? Can you then create more Ekman transport out of the northern Indian Ocean or less Ekman transport out of the northern Indian Ocean and create a regulation of the monsoon? So stronger uh, monsoon will lose heat on the uh, ocean side and then be damped and a weak, uh, Ekman, a weak monsoon would reduce the Ekman transport and build heat in the northern uh, Indian Ocean. Can this be a relation between ocean heat transport and annual cycle of the uh, monsoon? That's the key question and this is a theory that Webster has uh, argued for for a long time. Okay, we'll come to the details in the next podcast.